Hi, it's Kai. Number 10. Hymen moepimesis argraphica. A deadly virus isn't turning people into flesh-eating zombies yet, but there are actually some parasites that can manipulate and control the minds of their hosts, causing them to act in bizarre or self-destructive ways that ultimately benefit only the parasite, whether it's for nutrients or a new home or a new environment, you get it. First off, let's head to the tropical forests of Costa Rica and take a look at a wasp known as the Hymen oepimesis argraphica. Many species of wasps actually have parasitic qualities, and this is one of them. When a female of this wasp is about to lay her eggs, she seeks out one particular species, a spider called the orb spider. The orb spider is known for its elaborate web-spinning abilities with which it uses to catch its victims. Every day, it meticulously recreates its masterpieces, and for this talent, the expectant mother wasp targets the spider. They'll actually find the spider and infect it, laying their eggs inside the spider itself and shoving off the burden of raising its life-sucking young. The larva of this wasp not only makes a meal of the spider, it also turns the unfortunate arachnid into its personal slave with mind control. Once the eggs are ready to hatch, they'll start to release a set of chemicals, and it's these chemicals that cause the spider to go and do various things. The biggest thing, though, is it'll have the spider make a web, which on the surface doesn't sound odd as many spiders are known for this but this web is specifically designed for the wasp larva that is coming. What'll happen is the larva will burst out of the spider's abdomen, eat the spider, and then make a cocoon on the web that was made for them. So in recap, the spider is used as a host, is controlled to make a web, is then killed and eaten, and its hard work is used to house the next stage of wasp larva life. Yes, that indeed is very scary. Number nine, rabies. Technically speaking, rabies is not really a parasite, and yet it definitely acts like one. That's why it can travel from animals to humans so easily and cause all sorts of behavioral issues within the mind. Rabies manifests itself with a wide range of neurological signs, including changes in behavior, but also loss of motor control, says parasite expert, Andre Gomez of ICF International in Washington, D.C. The latter sometimes include difficulties with swallowing that eventually lead to hunger, hypoglycemia, and dehydration. The true scariness of this parasite is the fact that in animals like dogs, it's all too common and it can literally drive them mad, so much so that it compels them to spread the virus through biting and scratching. That's a huge reason why people are told to not pet wild dogs that they don't know, because if they're infected with rabies, all it takes is one bite or scratch, and suddenly you will be the ones acting aggressive and crazy and needing to get medical attention. Number eight, Lancet liver fluke. The Lancet liver fluke is a type of flatworm, a very infectious and nasty kind of worm, and it's known to infect grazing cows but that's just one part of a very nasty process that this worm happens to like. It'll live within the liver of the cow and lay eggs in it. Then those eggs are released through the feces of the cow, and that's where it finds its next host in snails. But no, they don't infect them. It has a bit of a way to go. You see, the snail eats the eggs, yes, within the feces, and then for some reason, it'll create a protective cyst around the newly hatched larva and spit them out as a slime ball of mucus. Gross, I know. What happens then? The slime ball gets consumed by ants. Once it's within the ant, it'll make its way to the ant's brain and it'll guide the ant to a thing like a blade of grass. Once on the grass, the ant will get eaten by a mammal, like a cow, and the process starts all over again. This is not only an incredibly roundabout way to infect and control an entity, you honestly have to wonder how in the world the Lancet liver fluke evolved to allow that to happen. But this is just the circle of life. Number seven, Emerald Cockroach Wasp. Remember how I said there are actually a lot of parasitic wasps? 
Here's another one. The emerald cockroach wasp, also known as the jewel wasp, is beautiful looking, but it has a secret that means any cockroach it finds within Asia, Africa, and the Pacific Islands is a ticking time bomb of death. This wasp will find a cockroach, which is about six times the size of the wasp, and then sting the cockroach. Once the cockroach is stung, it won't be able to move. It is now paralyzed. Then it'll start injecting special elixirs right into the brain of the cockroach. Yes, elixirs like magic potions, except the magic potion is mother nature. So the elixir paralyzes the cockroach and this is very bad for the cockroach now because it is basically a zombie, one the emerald cockroach wasp is in full control over. With it under its control completely, it'll move the cockroach to a nesting area that the wasp has set up and then it'll inject its eggs into the abdomen of the creature. In case you're wondering, yes, the cockroach is alive through all of this. That's what makes it so scary, is that it's feeling everything that's happening to it, but it can't move because of what the elixirs are doing in its brain. The final horror is that the wasp larva will eventually come out of the cockroach and eat it. Hey, real quick, if you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're liking this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Number six, influenza. This might confuse some of you as influenza is a virus. What's more, it's a virus that is known as the common flu. So how is something like this a parasite that changes the minds of those it infects? Well, in a 2010 study, scientists found out that those who were infected with the influenza virus were becoming more sociable people. Yeah, didn't see that one coming, did ya? The study was done with a group of people, and within 48 hours of getting the common flu, the people who were infected were much more inclined to hang out in places with a lot of people, like bars and parties. But why would this be? The belief is that the virus is acting in a parasitic way and that it wants the host, the person who has the flu, to hang out with more people, not because it cares about its social life, but rather because it's able to spread amongst the people that the host is now interacting with. To be clear, this has not been proven definitively, but it's something to get you thinking the next time you might have a cold. Number five, you have Florichus californiensis. You have Florichus californiensis is a parasite that not unlike many on this list has a very different kind of life cycle. For example, it starts out as a type of horn snail, and then it'll make a larva that'll seek out a very specific kind of fish known as a killifish. Rather deviously, the parasite will infect the fish through a weak point in its body, its gills. Once it's within the body of the fish, it'll work its way up to the very brain of the fish. But as you might've guessed, this isn't the intended target of this parasite. Rather, it will control the fish to reach its true target, birds, specifically water birds. If it can get to a bird, it'll be able to reproduce at the rate it wants. But how does it get from the fish to the bird? Simple, birds eat fish and they'll go after fish that they're sure are weak or don't suspect them coming. Thus, the parasite will cause the fish to jerk around or jump out of the water into the air and basically wait for the bird to notice it. The bird will then eat the fish and thus the parasite will be able to mate, reproduce within the bird. The bird will release its droppings over the water where they are consumed by horn snails and the process begins all over again. Bada boom, bada bang. Number four, kamikaze horsehair worm. Another great example of a classic parasitic worm is the kamikaze horsehair worm. A rather shocking element to this particular parasite is that it's not small. At max, it can be about a foot long and look like a cooked piece of spaghetti. Yeah, that's a big one. But before it can reach this length, it'll get snatched up by a house cricket or grasshopper and then start to work its magic on it and in a rather horrifying way develop inside the body of the insect. So it starts off life as a tiny worm and will infect a mosquito or a fly and then that bug will get eaten by a cricket or a grasshopper. 
a rather simple transfer method, but then the worm will start to grow and grow within the cricket or grasshopper, and that's when things get weird. Because to complete its cycle, if you will, it needs to be in the water. But most species of cricket or grasshopper won't go into the water, right? Well, it doesn't have a choice in the matter. The worm will literally hack into the nervous system of the creature, and then the worm gets it to literally jump to its doom into the water. It drowns as a result of that, and allows the horsehair worm to emerge and reproduce. As if all that wasn't enough, one cricket or grasshopper can be a home to a whole host of these parasites. Not a pretty picture when you consider it, right? Number three, Schistocephalus solidus. Schistocephalus solidus is a kind of tapeworm, which is also a very infectious and nasty type of worm in terms of what it can do to a host. And during an experiment by the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Biology in Germany, this tapeworm was put inside of crustaceans to see what would happen. Researchers wanted to see if the tapeworms would battle for control of the entity or merely work alongside one another to get the desired result. The Schistocephalus solidus is one who needs to be in fish in order to continue their lifestyle and life circle, in this case, a sickle fish. So naturally, they need to get the crustacean to the fish. How it does this is it'll use chemicals to make the crustacean more compliant and more importantly, more active. The more active it is, the easier it is to get the attention of the fish in question. But that's not the scary part. It was found out that the tapeworms would work together in order to increase the power of the chemicals they were using, and as such, have a much greater effect on the host. So thus, these parasites are more than willing to work together to get the job done. Truly horrifying. Number two, ladybird parasite. Parasites can be pretty clever to the extent that they know how to protect their own in order to survive such as with the ladybird parasite. This is another wasp that needs a host to protect its eggs from potential predators. So what better bodyguard than an insect with markings that suggest danger? The parasite knows that this beetle has bright red and black spots to warn off predators, as well as a poison to further detract predators. So the wasp will sting the beetle and leave one egg within it. The egg grows inside the ladybird beetle, and then it'll eat its way out of the body and then spin a cocoon between its legs. Why? Because now the beetle is standing guard over the cocoon. Furthermore, because it's still conscious if a predator does come near it, it'll be able to move just enough to ward it off. That's not just evolution, but intelligence to ensure survival. Number one, zombie fungus. Finally, we end with a fungus that acts like a parasite to one particular species, ants. So much so that the state it leaves the ants in is so complete that it's been dubbed the zombie fungus. So how does this all work? Well, the ant gets infected by spores from the fungus. The fungus will then infect the mind of the ant and have it go to a high place on a tree or some other plant. When the ant is high above all other ants, it will explode, in a way, in order to release more spores. The spores will then fall down, traveling to other ants, and the process continues. Thanks for watching. What do you think of these parasites that control their victims? Did you know about any of them before watching this video? Let me know in the comments below, and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. See you next time. Bye.